All right. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we're going to share with you today on this beautiful day. I'm going to conclude my remarks on the person of the Holy Spirit, this series I've called Truth About the Spirit. And one of the many ministries of the Holy Spirit is to fill us. So let me share a few things about that. Someone said that the new birth is an event of such magnitude that it requires a lifelong journey to incorporate, a journey marked by numerous watershed experiences of the Spirit's power given for the purpose of revealing God's love to us personally, empowering us to share his love. Such a good quote. Let me read Lloyd Ogilvy what he says. Time and time again, I've seen people who love the Lord but never seem to really be excited about serving him or being in his presence. But then they become clothed in the power of the Spirit and suddenly their lives change. Their walk becomes much more intensified. Their desire to serve grows. Their love deepens. And their commitment, accountability, and responsibility rapidly increase. Ephesians 3.19 And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And notice that Paul is writing that to Christians. He wanted them to experience more than they already had. Ephesians 5.18-20 to 20 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Almost always when you're <clears throat> reading scripture, you, you can have a good understanding of what it's saying without knowing the Greek grammar. And you can here as well. But there are four interesting things about the grammatical structure of verse 18, and especially the verb be filled. Let me give you those four pretty cool insights. <clears throat> The verb used for, and the you is implied there. You be filled is plural. The you is plural there, implying that everyone, not just one person, every Christian is to be filled. Secondly, the verb used for you be filled is continuous, implying repeated action. Thirdly, the verb used for to be filled is passive, be filled implying the filling is something that is done to you. God is the filler, you're the filly. You yield and respond. And fourthly, the verb used for you be filled is imperative, implying a command that must be obeyed. So are you asking to be filled? Just a little distinction again between the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. And this is just, again, my semantics, my, my terminology that I like to use and understand it by. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is positional truth, not commanded. <clears throat> A one-time event puts the believer in the position to receive power, whereas the filling of the Holy Spirit is experiential truth, commanded, can occur many times over a life, and is the receiving of power for service. So let's talk about how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit. The first thing, I think, is to recognize your thirst. In John 7, 37 to 39, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. It was at this part of the festival that the, the priests would pour water over the altar. And probably it was at that exact moment in the temple that Jesus spoke up and said, what I just quoted. 
Larry Crabb writes, until we acknowledge painful disappointment in our circumstances and relationships, we will not pursue Christ with the passion of deep thirst. Or to put it more simply, we rarely learn to meaningfully depend on him when our lives are comfortable. A.W. Tozer says, O oh God, <clears throat> I have tasted thy goodness, and it has both satisfied me and made me thirsty for more. I am painfully conscious of my need for further grace. I am ashamed of my lack of desire. O oh God, I want to know thee. I long to be filled with longing. I thirst to be more thirsty still. So the first thing is to recognize your thirst. Are, are you thirsty? Do you want more of God? Then secondly, repent of your sins and receive God's cleansing. Jeremiah 2.13 My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So if there's a brokenness in you, repent of that. Thirdly, yield all of yourself to the Holy Spirit's control. Think of Galatians 2.20, where Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I yield myself to Christ's lordship over my life. And then finally, trust God to fill you as he promised. There's often the idea of what signs accompany someone who's filled with the Spirit. Let me mention some signs that are not necessarily wrong, but they're not foolproof signs that you are filled with the Spirit. That would be tongues, emotion, exceptional ability, personal charisma, tranquility, freedom from problems, freedom from temptation, sinless perfection. But here are some scriptural signs. Joy, victory, power to witness, boldness, liberty, fruit of the Spirit, sensitivity to sin, praise, gifts of the Spirit operating, submission, and encouragement. Simply, when Jesus means more than life itself, when you've become overwhelmed with a new sense of joy, love, sacrifice, and service, and a desire to witness, you have discernment and power to live a holy life. So your conversion experience wasn't like everyone else's, and your filling with the Spirit isn't like everyone else's too. God will do something unique in you. So don't try to copy someone else's experience. I'm going to add, I guess, a P.S. to this this week. Um, and it's about certainty, and I guess I was listening in that list for Ed to say that certainty might be something that it is accompanied with the Holy Spirit. How far can certainty go? Um, this last Sunday in church, Ed um, spoke on Philippians 4 and you know, just brought up about anxiety, and I think everybody was keen into the fact that there's some area of our life that just... Um, puts us in an orbit of, of worry and or that we have to get the Lord to penetrate and stop that cycle. And so, you know, we as Christians are by our own admission, by our own name, saying, you know, we, we got a hope that works. And, you know, the world's watching us and the most painful question could be, um, I see this isn't working very well for you. So that would be the most painful question and statement to be said, but I think sometimes we need to ask ourselves, are we really walking in certainty of what we have in the unseen with Jesus? Please hear the scripture, which I believe is written with so many words to create certainty. Hebrews 6.19, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast, which reaches inside behind the curtain or veil, where Jesus, our forerunner, entered on our behalf 
since he became a priest forever. So again, is, is the reality of the sure and steadfast, is that working for you and me? Um, you know, I think it's when you're awake in the middle of the night, something's irreconcilable in your circumstances or mine, you've got nowhere to go. Are you going to find the anchor in that hour? Spurgeon, I believe, spent his whole life writing a sermon that's called The Anchor, and it is worth quoting some of his findings about the principles of an anchor. One of them he speaks of is from the land fast, the hook part, to the last link, which is actually going to be grasped by me, there can be no weakening. One millimeter in that whole extent of the anchor is going to ruin the whole thing. Every part of it has to be as strong as the other part. And we would want to say the part behind the veil is divine, so the divinity has to pass the hole through every chain onto my very grasp. I need the grasp of God to grasp the end of the chain. So the unseen grip of the anchor behind the veil. Very interesting. Uh, okay, some quotes from him. I've been interspersed a few things. But our anchor is like every other. When it is of any use, it's out of sight. So just think of that. Sometimes we think, well, if I saw this, I would believe it. The problem of out of sight is the problem for many. When a man sees the anchor lying in the boat, it's doing nothing. It's when the anchor is gone. It's gone overboard with a splash. Far down there, all among the fish, lies the iron steadfast, hold fast, quite out of sight. So Spurgeon says, do you believe because you can see? That's not believing at all. Do you believe because you can feel? That's feeling. It's not believing. But blessed is he that has seen and yet, not seen, and yet has believed. Blessed is he who believes against his feelings. Yes, and hopes against hope. Our hope is not seen. He lies in the waves, or as the text says, within the veil. So there's a poem that says, but can I by so slight a tie an unseen hope on God rely? Steadfast and sure it cannot fail. It enters deep within the veil. It fastens on a land unknown and moors me to my father's throne. So as Spurgeon had gone on, he said, what is the real thing God wants to hear from us? In and light of the veil or the anchor you have promised therefore do as you have said what grasp is firmer than this lord you have sworn it you cannot run back you have said that he that believes in you is justified from all sin lord i believe you therefore be pleased to do as you have said I know you cannot lie, and you have sworn that Christ is a priest forever. I am resting in him as my priest who has made a full atonement for me. I therefore hold you to your oath. Accept me for the sake of Jesus' sacrifice. Can you reject a soul whom your own son is pleading? It goes on. He intercedes to the uttermost for those who draw near through him. I have you. This is the anchor that I have cast into the deep, mysterious attributes of your wondrous nature. So I guess I thought of my Christian walk, and I haven't really you know, done maybe the promises of God and one for every day like some people. But as I started to think, any statement in Scripture where God says, I will do this, that, that's basically a promise. And if we think of the worth of the one who made the promise, I mean, I was thinking I, I would walk off a cliff for that promise or I would walk off a cliff on that promise. So when does a promise, in a sense, become incarnate? Well, I have gotten so much out of something I heard John Cooper, who's actually of the um, rock, Christian rock group Skillet. He's being called to address culture right now and doing a lot of reading 
He read the book, The Doctrine of the Word of God by John Frame. And he tells this, like, okay, again, the bed analogy, you know, you have irreconcilably, it's irreconcilable things you're thinking about. And all of a sudden you realize Jesus is sitting on the edge of the bed. He's saying, it is me. Do not be afraid. I have overcome the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Peace I give to you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, wow, Jesus on the end of the bed telling me that would calm me. But the thing that the doctrine of the word of God is telling us, that in the same way Jesus is on the end of our bed, that is what the word is meant to do. It's full of the promises of God. Can we receive that what the word as a person is doing, we have this honor to grasp by his promises, Jesus sitting as on the edge of our bed, that Christ may dwell in our hearts by faith. And very briefly, just this whole picture of the anchor, there's another part of the anchor which adds to its certainty, and it's the forerunner himself. In the ancient days, um, a ship, would draw into the harbor, but because of the dark, it couldn't go too far. So a sailor would get into a boat. He would go to the land. As he got to the land, he would then put the land fast into the land. Then the next morning, instead of the anchor moving, the boat is moving. It's winching closer to the shore. And it's winching closer to the shore where its anchor is, which is Jesus. Jesus is on the shore. We are in the boat. The anchor is so solid behind the curtain. We are moving to the a certainty that he has behind the veil for us. And I'll credit Reinhold Bonnke with um, that analogy of the forerunner. These things are meant to become certain and certainty upon certainty for us. How far can certainty go? It can become incarnate. It begins with the divine on each end of the anchor and its hold. And until it meets the forerunner, we are moored to the Father's throne and literally, it does what Jesus on the end of our bed does. Thank you. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your Son, the solid rock in whom we anchor our faith in him. And thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, who among the many ministries he does he fills us again and afresh with more of you as we surrender to you may we do that today in jesus name amen have a great day